Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, in the hot seat today is Roshani Jasindra Moraz, Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer of Property Group of John Keels Holdings, as we focus on mixed use developments. Then, Hasta Premratna, Market Analyst and LD Columnist, gives us his take on the Colombo Wars. And in our final segment, we discuss the contents of the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission report with Gehan Gunatilaka, Research Director of Verite Research. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to the Big Picture Business Program Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Today we're focusing on the property development sector and also the development projects that are currently underway in Colombo. To offer her unique perspective, we have Roshani Jayasundra Morais, the Chief Marketing Officer of John Kills Properties Group. Roshani, looking around Colombo, it's looking quite fab. We're seeing all those cranes up there and it just shows that the uh, city is burgeoning. What is your view of the property development landscape at the moment? I think it's uh, it's a very interesting industry right now, and if you if you look at uh, how it has evolved, it has evolved from land and houses to what it is today, as in condominiums, high rises, basically what we call vertical living. However, I must say this is not new in Sri Lanka. The low rise vertical living was present even in the in, in some decades ago as in um, the golf face courts bumblepitia flats anderson flats so it's not new but it has evolved to what it is now the modern vertical living i think really took off post war when um, john keels and a few other companies started especially when we started bonac and emperor and along with that there were a few other companies who did a few projects um, and coming back to what you asked, yes, I think it's a very vibrant industry now and um, uh, quite an interesting industry. Yeah. Mm, we're certainly seeing an uh, upward movement in also the quality of uh, property development that's coming up in, in Colombo especially, isn't it? I think ours, is, um, ours compare very well with the international standards. Uh, we have a lot of foreign buyers, Sri Lankans living overseas and even foreigners investing here. And they're very happy with the quality that the industry is delivering. What are the key trends you are seeing currently when you look at the property development uh, industry in Sri Lanka? Like I said, it has moved from housing schemes to gated communities to now the vertical living as in condominiums. Uh, the demand has come from two ways. You have the owner-occupied segment, people buying to use it, to live. And you have also uh, the investors looking at a different investment other than putting your money in the bank. Now, this has become an investment instru uh, instrument uh, and a quite a good one at that. Because in the past, some of our projects have given 10 to 12 percent capital appreciation per annum and about 6 to 8 percent rental return. So both put together, it's a very good return uh, to the investor. Roshani, you were just talking about the uh, people using property development in one sense as an investment. Now, the prevailing investment climate in Sri Lanka, is it conducive to such large scale ventures that we are seeing right now? Yes, most certainly. And hence, Cinnamon Life, we've decided to uh, launch this big project. Uh, it's an $850 million investment. Uh, and we're very confident that there is a market for this. It's, um, it's manifold. I, it's a tourism play. It's an investment play. It's a residential play. It's a retail and entertainment play. So it has many facets to this. Um, uh, this project has many aspects which would be very attractive to an investor or a consumer. This project is mainly targeting the tourism segment. You know, tourism is is rapidly developing in Sri Lanka. We're targeting the tourism segment and the mice market. The mice market out of India, due to capacity limitations, we haven't been able to cater to. 
With this, we intend to create the capacity to cater to that. You know, the meetings, incentives, conferences out of India, they are such large scale and they come in large numbers and we don't have the capacity to cater to that. We hope with this, that with the capacity we are creating, that we'll be able to attract that market, which will be a new segment to Sri Lanka. Again, speaking of investment, the price of land in Sri Lanka has gone up considerably. Is that a pro factor or a con factor when you look at an investment? Well, land is a limited commodity. It would only go up. So the prices have gone up with demand. Uh, despite that, if you look at uh, uh, the luxury end of the properties that are available in the market, our pricing is in the 300 to $500 per square foot category. Now, when you compare this with Hong Kong or Singapore, prices in those countries are three or fourfold. So it's still a good price. For an international investor, it's still a good price. And actually, this is the time to come into Sri Lanka as an investor. Um, at the Beijing International Property Show, you uh, said, I quote, Chinese overseas property investments over the last few years have grown astron astronomically, and Sri Lanka is perfectly positioned along the Silk Route and will be a strategic hub in Asia. Now, what key markets does Sri Lanka need to focus on when promoting the country as an attractive investment destination? I think our key markets should be China, and we just tried, uh, tried for uh, showcasing our product in China. What was the response like? Very encouraging. Lots of people are interested. I think we still have to do a little work here because uh, if I may expand on that, the Chinese buyer looks for a few things when they invest. Uh, they primarily look for a residential visa. I mean, they like to invest, stay in that country for a, li a little while, enjoy. Uh, and countries like the US, Australia, Europe, Canada, they offer these visas for big investors. Uh, and I think our government is looking at that. Uh, if we can come up with some, some scheme where we can offer a residential visa with no work permit, that will be very attractive. Then I think the second market would be India. You see a lot of Indians investing, high net worth Indians from all over the world investing in mature property uh, real estate markets. Now, Sri Lanka does not show up on the real estate radar for these investors because we haven't, we haven't marketed Sri Lanka as a real estate destination. Uh, I think we need to do that as an industry. Uh, we have to get together and market Sri Lanka as an industry. Another market, I think, is the uh, Middle East. The Middle Eastern investor, too, is going around investing in mature markets. So if you take three key markets that we're looking at currently, it, I would think it's China, India, and the Middle East. So we're going to come back to you after a short break. We've been talking to Roshani Jayasundra Morais, and after the break, we ask Roshani about the major challenges facing the property development sector, as well as a little bit more about waterfront properties, which is the luxurious Cinnamon Life project. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Wondrous place for you and me. A 
The most advanced technology now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to HB New World Banking. Thank you for staying with Benchmark. We are returning to our discussion on property development with Roshani Jaisundara Moraes, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of the John Keels Property Group. So, Roshani, just getting back to what we were discussing. The property development sector has challenges, undoubtedly, because also it's one that is recent. It has sort of taken on an upward momentum quite recently, and the trajectory of growth is quite large. So if you look at that, what are the major challenges that you're facing? I think resources in terms of labor and professionals. Uh, another, another challenge would be uh, the time taken for regulatory approvals uh, and if I look at it from a marketing perspective, marketing the industry to foreigners, I think uh, some of the some of the processes in bringing money in, taking money out, though we have all that in place, it does take time. So some of the approval processes, I would think. Now, John Kills has just embarked on this 4.5 million square foot integrated resort project, 800 room luxury hotel, high end retail mall, the luxury residency, state of the art office complexes, entertainment hub, you name it, it's all there. How significant is Cinnamon Life, or is this project, the Waterfront Properties project, in the context of the current development landscape? Where are you positioning it? I think it's quite significant, Savi. Uh, we expect it to be a game changer. We expect it to attract new markets. We expect it to change the face of Colombo. Hopefully that would be uh, the icon of the new Colombo. We would like it to be the Eiffel Tower of Colombo, the Sydney Opera House of Colombo. So it is, it is positioned in, 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 in an iconic kind of... It's a city within a city. It's, uh, we've designed it in such a way that when you get in there, you don't have to go out to get anything. You'll have residential facilities, you'll have hotel facilities, F&B, like you said, uh, the entertainment mall, the offices. Uh, so you name it, we have it. How would you respond to claims that Sri Lanka will witness uh, an oversupply in the luxury property market? Uh, we are thinking or the, the uh, research intelligence unit came up with a uh, uh, figure of 6,000 units uh, by 2018-19, whereas it was 783 in 2009 and 2,657 this year. Oversaturation, oversupply, is there a market? It depends on how you look at the market. If you look at your market as a domestic customer, the only the Sri Lankan local customer within Sri Lanka, perhaps in four to five years, there might be an oversupply. But if you look at the international market, the international real estate market, the customers in the international arena who are investing in international mature real estate markets, then I don't think there is an oversupply. I think we can manage the supply. Just the Chinese investor alone last year invested $52 billion in international real estate, not inside China. This is not domestic China. This is international investment. Now, we haven't got any of that. This is just the Chinese investor. Now you have all the other investors. And like I said earlier, Sri Lanka doesn't show up yet on that real estate investment radar. So I think we have to get out there and market ourselves. Sri Lanka tourism has done that wonderfully. I think we should follow suit. Developers should get together and market as an industry, as a destination. We should sell the country first before we sell our project. And I think then we'll have the market. In your luxury segment, Roshani, are people, investors, and people who are renting uh, looking at eco-friendly living? There is a trend towards that. Everybody is very conscious of sustainability and environment, uh, is environmental issues. And customers do ask us about, uh, about the facilities we provide within. Uh, 
uh, and yes, most of our new developments take that into consideration. So how would you characterize future prospects for integrated projects or mixed development projects as it's known in Sri Lanka? Future prospects, I think uh, if development takes off the way we expect it to take off, I think we'll have, the future prospects will be good. Uh, mixed developments are not new again. Crescat City, many years ago, is the same thing. It's a mixed development. It's a city within a city. Cinnamon Life will be something similar, but on a larger scale, more modern, more contemporary. Um, that's the first in Sri Lanka. But I'm sure there will be many more. And we, we hope the others will follow uh, and build many more to make Sri Lanka a destination. So the future of property development, integrated living. Thank you very much, Roshani. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. My pleasure. So now you know what to expect in the property development sector in Sri Lanka. We've been talking to Roshani Jayasundara Morais, the Chief Marketing Officer of the John Keels Properties Group. And on the other side, Anushan Selvaraj. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous place for you and me A whole new world The most advanced technology, now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to h &B New World Banking. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the boards, joining me is market analyst and LMB columnist Hasta Premratna. Good to have you back, Hasita. Now, to begin with, the boss is quite flat at this point of time. So, what are the sensitivities behind this? Yeah, I think uh, if you look at the last month, we've seen about two, three dimensions uh, adversely impacting the market. On one side, we saw uh, 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 Sri Lankan political situation post-election was not really recovering at the same way one would have expected uh, and, and didn't give the same level of stability that uh, people expected uh, post-election. So that was a uh, concern. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we had the global markets also in a bit of turmoil with uh, uh, China depreciating their currency and then US uh, holding on to the interest rate uh, increase that they were planning to do. Uh, and put together all these uh, factors continue to uh, uh, pull funds out of the emerging markets. So most of the emerging markets went through uh, difficult times with their currencies depreciating on one side. On the other hand, their stock markets also uh, coming down. Uh, so this was seen in the Sri Lankan market as well. We saw a significant amount of foreign outflows uh, from the market as well as from the bond market, uh, the Sri Lankan uh, bonds. Uh, so, put together, the, this outflow of uh, uh, foreign net foreign outflow did have an impact on the currency as well. So, with this currency depreciation, and the, still we see that the currency is not stabilized yet. So, because of these factors, obviously investors are a little bit worried, and that has led to the market to remain uh, at these levels. Actually, it has come down during the month of September and stayed at these levels for some time now. So, I think. The, the, the current volatility and the current decline is something that uh, has to do with uh, both the local factors as well as the uh, foreign uh, market developments. There are papers being tabled in Parliament to increase the amount that can be borrowed from the Treasury to 400 billion. Now, uh, what are the consequences of uh, such a move? Should it go through, Hasita? 
the, the, the government needs money to meet, meet certain expenses, repay debt and, and get into some of the other uh, projects, uh, especially the infrastructure side of projects uh, to, to uh, kick start and move on. Uh, so for that, the, the heavy borrowing is the route that the government has uh, taken because obviously we've not seen uh, uh, sufficient FDI is coming at this point of time, probably when the government starts the process of investing and giving that uh, initial push, you might see the investors also joining the party. So it might take a little bit of time for that to happen, but initial uh, decisions and the, and the key push has to come from the government. So that's probably why the government will have to uh, take this move that will obviously have an impact on the budget deficit where the coming budget we can expect the deficit to be uh, widening. Uh, but having said that, I think uh, we, 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 should, we should also see at the, in the meantime the f uh, funding route for that deficit to be more uh, local, locally uh, sourced debt than uh, maybe the commercial borrowings that uh, previous government did there. Right? The pre commercial borrowings will continue but not at the same pace that it, it, is, it used to be. Uh, so essentially there will be more uh, uh, local borrowings that can come uh, with the budget process. So what it can do to the economy and to the market? Well, it can definitely have an impact on the interest rates because one thing that we are seeing already is that interest rates are slightly moving up though the central bank has uh, held the policy rates unchanged this month. I think uh, the, the, the deposit rates and the lending rates are seeing an increase already. So we, we can expect that increase to uh, continue. Uh, maybe 100 to 200 basis points of uh, increase in interest rates is something that is not uh, uh, far away in my view. How do investors perceive the current government? Uh, are they doing better than the previous one or is it still uh, same old, same old? I think still the coalition uh, approach is new to the country and new to the government, new to the ministers, new to everybody, which means that there is a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty around how uh, people are going to move uh, forward in this uh, background. So due to this uncertainty uh, and, and lack of clarity, uh, we are not really seeing the type of uh, stability that one would have expected in the economy and the political environment post uh, general election. Uh, so this has created a lot of uh, ambiguity in the investors mind as well. Most investors are still watching. Uh, but having said that, I think um, there are certain things like the international relations uh, and, and, and also the good, good governance aspect has improved. So that's something that this new government uh, was, was talking about in the election platform. So that seemed to be on the improving side and on the positive side. However, uh, the, the development projects to sort of kickstart and move at a rapid pace, uh, we haven't seen that as yet. So I, we are already talking about some of the Chinese funded projects uh, restarting uh, and some of the new investments to come through. So that's something that is uh, very important to get on at this point of time. So uh, those two, three things are still pending. In my view, uh, these aspects will keep uh, uh, in limbo for some more time uh, because obviously the coalition government is still uh, struggling to figure out their ro roles uh, and, and, and how, uh, each, how it's going to function in the future. So in this backdrop, investors should also expect uh, some level of uh, uh, uncertainty, lack of clarity to continue, uh, which is which, which not going to have an impact on the longer term fundamentals, but of course in the short run, uh, there will be some delays in uh, certain aspects taking place. But broadly, we can expect the investors to uh, uh, remain a little bit volatile and, and, and ambiguous and volatile market conditions uh, are likely to continue. Thank you for joining us, Hasita. Thank you. That was market analyst and LMD columnist Hasita Premaratna. We will be back after a short commercial break. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC.
We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous space for you and me A whole new world The most advanced technology, now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to HMB New World Banking. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. This week, we thought we'd go into the nitty-gritty of the LLRC, which is the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. So we have invited into our studio Research Director from Verity Research, Gehan Kunathilaka. Good to have you on the show. But uh, what, uh, who appointed the LLRC and also what did the LLRC report actually say? Thanks, Anushan. Um, so, incidentally, the LLRC was actually appointed by the previous government. It was Mahinda Rajapaksa that uh, appointed the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission in 2010. Uh, it subsequently released its report in 2011, and um, there was a national plan to implement the recommendations that was published in 2012, uh, and then updated in 2013. So, it's been an ongoing process. What it actually said was quite intriguing because even though it was meant to look at the circumstances in which the CFA collapsed and look at the facts and circumstances that led to the 19th of May, it actually went beyond its mandate uh, and investigated uh, certain incidents that took place after the war. Uh, it also looked at incidents uh, previous to 2002. Uh, so it, it really did make a, a valuable contribution uh, to the, the reconciliation process. Uh, of course, there were criticisms of its analysis on accountability, uh, and that's the basis on which there are calls for additional steps to be taken. Um, but si thinking about the LLRC, it's really a good foundation uh, to build a reconciliation process. So I would say that uh, the LLRC has been a, a useful contribution. What are some of the highlights from the LLRC recommendations? If you think about the LLRC's recommendations in terms of thematic uh, categories, uh, there are about 11 categories, uh, out of which I can mention five that are extremely important. Uh, so it made some uh, rather forward-looking recommendations on uh, demilitarization, uh, then on land rights, uh, freedom of expression, uh, the independence of institutions, civil institutions like the Public Service Commission, National Police Commission, uh, and of course, it made some very important recommendations uh, on the area of um, devolution. Uh, so if you look at the themes covered by the LLRC, it really covered the gamut of governance issues as well as human rights and reconciliation matters. So these were quite important. Some of the highlights, I mean, off the top of my head, I could say that it called, for, for example, for, for a Right to Information Act uh, to be um, brought in swiftly. Uh, it also called on um, certain governance reforms like bringing back the uh, 17th Amendment, uh, which at the time had been overhauled through the 18th Amendment, and to have an independent police commission and, and human rights commission. Um, so some of these governance-related uh, recommendations were actually quite useful, and you now see um, this government interested in implementing some of those recommendations that the previous government didn't. So to what extent have these recommendations been implemented? That's a good question. Um, I can answer that question in sort of two stages. If you look at uh, progress up to the end of last year, um, progress was quite poor. Um, just to give you some numbers, uh, more than 60% of the recommendations have not seen any positive uh, progress. Um, only 19 out of the 189 recommendations uh, had actually been completed, in, fully implemented in a sense. Uh, so progress was poor if you look at December 31st, 2014. Uh, if you look at this year's progress, particularly since the transition, uh, I would say there's a marginal improvement, but still a marginal improvement, where we're now talking about, say, a 10 to 15 percent uh, improvement in implementation. So instead of 19 recommendations, there are 24 recommendations that have been fully implemented. Uh, and around 50% have seen positive progress. So I would say there's a 
a, a marginal shift uh, in terms of the government's commitment to uh, implement these recommendations. Now, Gehan, you've gone into this in detail. You've researched the entire subject. So, uh, in your mind, uh, what, if any, of the recommendations can be implemented in the short term? Um, I think you can look at each category and come up with recommendations that can be implemented tomorrow. Um, and these are really important, not, in t not just in terms of the value of implementing recommendations, uh, you know, presented by a commission, appointed by the government, but also in terms of building trust. Because as you remember, the LLRC was appointed in 2010, now in 2015. So in a sense, uh, the failure to implement some of those easier recommendations will erode the trust that people will have uh, in even the present government to move forward. Um, so in a sense, I think we can look at recommendations like the Right to Information Act. The LLRC very clearly um, recommends that such an act be passed without delay in order to guarantee you know, good governance, open government, uh, transparency, and also media freedom. Uh, I think it's important that some of the constitutional provisions that the LLRC refers to, say for example, the establishment of the National Land Commission, which is meant to formulate uh, policies, national policies, with the participation of provincial councillors. So there are several recommendations I think that can be implemented immediately. One that, another one that comes to mind is releasing the detainee list. Many people have called for this. The response consistently from government has been that uh, the detainee list is available. Uh, so then we ask the question, why not release it? Um, so I think it's a question of both implementing it as a matter of principle and also implementing it as a matter of pragmatism to build trust. Uh, in those who have been following this uh, fairly carefully. Thank you very much for joining us, Gehan. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was Research Director from Verite Research, Gehan Gunatilaka. Thank you for watching Benchmark, and we hope to see you again next time.